Iron Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, Star Wars, is there an underlying message of the gospel woven through some of the most popular movies today? Is there a way to use modern media as an evangelistic tool to reach the lost? Is there a way to use the superhero phenomenon to create meaningful gospel-centered conversations with the youth? Is there some correlation between the superheroes that we see in our movies today and the ultimate superhero, Jesus Christ? Join Join me and my good friend, Dr. Frank Turek, today as we talk about Hollywood heroes. Well, hey, 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 everybody. Happy Tuesday evening to you. I hope you all are doing great today. We have another exciting live stream today, and uh, we're not going to waste your time. we got a lot of things we want to talk about. I'm very, very excited to be here with my friend, Dr. Frank Turek, which I, uh, who I'll bring on in just a second. But uh, this is an exciting time, guys, because we get to see some creative ways that we can engage this culture using modern media. And so I'm going to go ahead and bring uh, Frank on. Frank, how are you doing this evening, man? Good to have you back on the I channel. am great, Alan. It's always great being with you and your fine tribe there. What's happening? Oh, man, it's awesome. Guys, you guys know Frank is no stranger to the channel. He's been on with us. Uh, at least three times. This is the fourth time. And we love to, we have a lot of things in common and we love to come on and um, do live streams together. Tonight's topic is a little bit of a different topic uh -huh. as you're going to see, but hopefully I pray that you guys keep an open mind because I trust that you'll walk away with some tangible things that hopefully you and I will be able to use to better evangelize the lost and those youth as well. That's right. So, that's right. That's what we're after. That's what we're after, guys. So uh, this is what we want to cover. All right. This is what we want to cover tonight. Tonight's agenda is first and foremost, guys, we want to lay down the principle, the biblical principle. OK, so basically just to back up a little bit, what we're talking about tonight is essentially how modern media Essentially, more specifically, movies, superhero movies, things like that, how there are there's underlying messages of the gospel woven in in these movies. Right. And so what would be the biblical precedent or biblical principle that we can look at that would suggest that this very well may be a good evangelistic tool to use to spark common ground conversations with people in our neighborhoods, people who are uh, maybe uh, on the job or our family members who may not know Christ, but they're watching these movies, could there be a way? And is there a biblical principle that would lead us to that? The second thing we want to look at is, okay, what is the overarching principle, but then the precedent? How was this actually uh, practiced in the in church, in, in uh, Paul's life, in Jesus' life, right? So what was the precedent that was laid out for this? And then, guys, we're going to jump into the pictures, right? You know I'm a, a, I'm a preacher, so I got to alliterate. The pictures. <laughs> we're going to actually look at several of the, of the uh, most popular, most common superhero movies, and we're going to break them down, and we're going to try to see, is there a gospel message in these movies? And if so, how can we be creative? Which leads me to the fourth thing that we're going to talk about, and that is the practice. You're going to leave here with some tangible ways for you to go out and practice this. So if you're on the airplane, or if you're talking to your neighbors, or if you're at work, or if you have a family member who comes over for um, Christmas or holidays or one of the uh, time, birthday, Mother's Day is coming up, and they've watched these movies, but they don't know Christ, what might there be a way for you to be able to share your faith or at least have some common ground conversations, or maybe you have a teenager in the house and mm -hmm. maybe they're not interested in spiritual things, but they're watching Iron Man, they're watching Batman, they're watching these movies, and it might be a way for you to connect with that young person. So uh, we're going to jump in and we are going to start off, guys, with the principle, the biblical principle. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this and then Frank is going to talk about mm -hmm. the precedent. So what is the principle that we're looking at tonight? The principle is laid out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul basically says this, To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win Jews. All right, now, to those under the law, like one under the law. 
Now, what is Paul saying? We're going to do a little Bible study tonight. What Paul is saying is that even though I am not under the law anymore because I'm saved by grace, even though I have no obligation, no spiritual obligation to obey the law in the same way that the Old Testament saints did. He says, in order for me to have the opportunity to be able to effectively share my faith with my fellow Jews, I've got to bend, I've got to adapt, I've got to adopt, I've got to in some ways assimilate and be like them so that I can find common ground between myself, somebody who is not under the law, with those who are still under the law. That's why he says, though I myself am not under the law, but I will accommodate that, I will adjust so that I can win those who are under the law. Hopefully you see where we're going here, all right? Now he says, to those who are without the law, speaking like the Gentiles, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. Let me break that down. Paul says, Listen, for those people out there who are without the law, let's just say they're Gentiles. He says, you know what? There are some things that I might do differently so that I may be able to have common ground and appeal to someone who is outside of the law. But he says, wait, don't get it twisted. Just because we're not under the obligation of the Old Testament law doesn't mean I can do anything I want to do. I'm still under the law of Christ, right? Right. And he says, to win those without the law. And then he says, to the weak, I became weak. Do you notice the theme here? Paul is saying, I will adjust my behavior. I will adjust how I relate to people. I will even adjust the conversations that I might have with people based on how I assess where they are. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. And so guys, this is the basic principle that we're laying down today, which is the idea that you and I cannot just go and say to somebody, hey, you're going to hell and you're a sinner <laughs> and you need to accept Jesus, right? We need to find some common ground. Frank, what are your thoughts before we move on to the precedent? Well, that's absolutely what needs to happen. And as we're about to see, Alan, this is exactly what Paul did and it's exactly what Jesus did. They adapted their approach to meet the people where they were. So let's take a look at the precedent for Absolutely. that. And, Absolutely. And, and, and by the way, Alan, I got to give you a hand because that was so well said, man. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Frank. And, I, I appreciate look, Alan, that, that, that uh, yeah, that was good, that was good. Alan came up with the whole, the whole concept for this show, ladies and gentlemen, he did all this. You can see he's, he's, he's definitely got some preacher tendencies here. He got everything alliterated, man. I love this. Like a Baptist preacher, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's start with Paul, because you were just talking about Paul. When he goes to Athens, this is in Acts 17, he's, he's greatly distressed because he sees the whole city's filled with idols, right? How's he going to reach these people? And if you read what he actually does in Acts 17, he takes an incremental approach to build common ground with people. He starts where they are. Go to the verse there that you, you, you have there. It says this, that uh, uh, Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and he said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. So what's he doing? He's complimenting them because they have all these altars around there and there's one altar there that they have. It's an altar to an unknown God. So he's complimenting them. And then he's gonna say, this is very good. You're very uh, religious. For I was passing through and observing your objects of worship. I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. In other words, they were worried that if, if, they, didn't, if they didn't have a God out there that really existed, if they didn't have an altar to that God, they might be in some way judged. So say, let's, let's just cover our bases. Let's just put an altar here to an unknown God, and that'll be for him. In any event, so he's going to say, look, now I'm going to tell you about this unknown God, that this God is neither served by hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life, breath, and all things. Now, keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to the next verse here, Paul now is getting a little bit more. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We don't have that up there. Yeah. Let me just say exactly what he says here. Um, 
He's getting a little bit more aggressive as he goes on. He starts with common ground. You've got this. You're very religious. I see you have an altar to an unknown God. I walked around. I looked at your objects and saw this. And then he said, the God who made everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you if you know the topography of what's going on here, Paul is speaking on a place called Mars Hill, which is a rocky outcrop right under the Parthenon where the the Greeks had built 400 years prior this great Parthenon to their goddess Athena. Hence, we get the term Athens or the city name Athens because this was her city. And so they thought that Athena actually dwelt in that Parthenon. And so here's Paul below that, or that's right behind him as he's speaking, saying, that the true God doesn't 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 dwell in temples built by human hands, and they thought their Athena was right behind them. So so he's not being all real nice and 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 skirting around the truth. He's he's given them the truth, but he's given the, them the truth in about a gentle as way as he can. And he starts then quoting uh, uh, their own poets. He starts quoting Greek poets. Why? Because the Greek poets are uttering the truth. Even though they weren't they weren't Christians, they were still uttering the truth when they would say, in Zeus, we live and move and have our beings. Well, Paul would just insert Yahweh. In Yahweh, we, we live and move and have our being. In Christ, we live and move and have our being. So he's quoting their stories. Let me say it this way, Alan. You know what he's you know what he's doing? He's quoting the movies of their day mm. in order to meet them where they are. And so Paul is doing this, and then Jesus does this as well. Jesus actually tells parables. And uh, it says here in Matthew 13, then he told them many parables, and he goes on to tell about the sower who went out to sow. And, and he also tells parables about the good Samaritan. He tells parables about uh, all sorts of different characters. Now, these are stories. Are they true stories? Like, where, if you went to Israel and at, at that time, would you find the guy that was a good Samaritan? No, that's not the point. They're fictional stories designed to present a theological or moral lesson to people. And that's what movies can do if you look at them properly. So that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, guys. So once again, not to, not to over, overstep, but basically that's exactly right, guys. Paul and Jesus, they were masters once again at forming common ground. Jesus could have just come out and said, hey, look, you're a sinner. You should believe in me. I'm the savior. You're evil. I'm holy. You're going to hell. But what he did was he looked around and he said, you know what? Let me start with something they're familiar with. They're familiar mm -hmm. with the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. They're familiar with fig trees. They're familiar with um, uh, you know, they're familiar with agriculture. The, the, the yeah. Valley yeah. of Gehenna. They're familiar yeah, yeah, with these yeah. things. Right. And so he says, let me start where they are with a, with a, with an earthly story, right. Or with that has a heavenly meaning. And that's really what mm -hmm. a parable is. So how does that now correlate to the third thing that we're going to talk about? And this, we're going to camp out a little bit. We're going to start looking at some of the movies, some of the super superhero movies that are most popular in our culture today. And Frank is going to really break down how there is an underlying gospel message that might surprise you in many of these movies. Now, let me just say this because I can already see some of the comments and all this and that. We are not, we are not uh, co-signing everything that happens in these movies. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. before you go there and say, how could brother Allen and Frank Turk, you know, a pastor and a PhD guy, how could they, how could they do? No, no, no. All we're simply doing is we're taking certain principles from these movies that we know the rest of the world is watching. And we're trying to look at ways that we can use them for evangelical evangelistic tool. We're not saying that all the language is good. We're not saying that all of the behavior is good. We're not saying that. All right. So hopefully that's clear. <laughs> By the way, Alan, let me say something about that, because yeah. that's even true of the Bible. Oh, boy. right. There's so many stories in the Bible that are stories about evil. And what does Paul say? Paul says in First Corinthians and also Romans that these stories, these examples were in the in the Old Testament in order to be examples to you as to what not to do. <laughs> and, and actually, there were some 
virtuous stories about what to do. So you see David and Bathsheba. David kills Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He lies about it. He does all these evil things, right? That's in there to say to us, this is not something you want to do. Look what happened to David's life even after he did all these things. Not only did he sin against God, he sinned against his countrymen, he sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against everybody, and the consequences were devastating. So there's even bad stories in the Bible that we have to take lessons from, and we can do the same thing from movies. That's awesome. That's awesome. So speaking of that, we're going to go into the third one, the pictures, all right? the pictures or the movies. So, so Frank, this is my first question for you. Some Christians are weary, right, of engaging popular culture, especially movies like Star Wars or, God forbid, the Harry Potter series. Ooh. Yes. What do you say about that? What do you say to Christians that were like, hey, you know, Christians shouldn't even be watching these things because there's sorcery, there's witchcraft, there's all this stuff. Right. What are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, I agree with whatever parents think is right for their kids. So I'm not going to tell a parent what they think, what I think their kids should see or not. OK, it's up to the parents on, on this kind of thing. And not every movie we talk about, Alan, is age appropriate for everybody. Right. I mean, they have to be a, a, a mature audience. Some of these movies or at least teenage years, maybe you're not going to show your five year old some of these movies you might show your 15 year old. Right. OK. But secondly, let's just take Harry Potter, because that's the most controversial one. A lot of people are really spooled up against Harry Potter because Harry Potter has all this wizardry in it. Let me say a few things about that. Number one, the wizardry in Harry Potter is a fiction of J.K. Rowling's imagination. She doesn't think any of this stuff is true. This is not divination in the Bible where you're trying to contact the dead. That's not what she's doing. That, Nobody thinks that you can get on a broomstick and fly around anywhere in real life, right? This is a fictional fantasy story. So secondly, the kind of wizardry that you see in, in Harry Potter is similar to the wizardry that you see in Lord of the Rings and, Car and Chronicles of Narnia. I mean, after, we're Gandalf, after all, Gandalf is a wizard, right? Why do Christians have no problem with Lord of the Rings and, and Chronicles of Narnia, but somehow Harry Potter is off limits? Thirdly, if you look at the Harry Potter story, Harry Potter probably has more in common with Jesus than any other character in modern fiction. Think about this. Harry Potter is prophesied to be the savior of his world before he's born. Secondly, Harry Potter has to live a morally good life in order to, be, to actually be the savior. Number three, he actually dies, sacrifices himself, to try and defeat Voldemort, who is the Satan figure in the story. But then Harry, number four, rises from the dead to defeat Voldemort, and the people had to have to put their faith in him in order to do it. Now, does that sound familiar? <laughs> in fact, J.K. Rowling, who wrote the whole series, said, first of all, the biblical backbone of this, I didn't want to reveal to people because I didn't want them to know where the story was going. And secondly, she said the entire series can be epitomized by two Bible verses. One is where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. That's uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 21. That's in the movie and the book, as well as the other verse, which is the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that's on the tombstone of Harry Potter's parents. And, and Rowling says these two verses epitomize the whole series. So I think if we take a step back and point out these are fantasy movies, they're not meant to mirror everything about the real world, but they do mirror four major uh, aspects of Jesus's life in an uncanny way. These are biblical stories that J.K. Rowling has just fantasized. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Great, great start. Great start. So now... Frank, now you say that even movies written by anti-Christian writers and directors contain elements that we can use for evangelism. Can you give me an example or can you give me some examples of these, of these anti-Christian writers and the elements that we could use for evangelism today? Yeah, sure. How about Wonder Woman? Uh, Wonder Woman, there are two major movies in which Wonder Woman appears. Well, she also appears in Justice League, but the two major movies for her were Wonder Woman from 2017 and Wonder Woman 1984 from about 2020, came out Christmas Day 2020. In these two movies, Alan, when she is going up against Ares in the first movie, 
Ares, who is her brother, who is evil, who wants to kill all humanity because they're evil. He says this to Wonder Woman. He says, they don't deserve your protection. And Wonder Woman says, it's not about deserve. It's about what you believe. And I believe in love. Well, that's exactly the biblical gospel, if you think about it. We don't get what we deserve. We, what we get is based on what we believe, we get love, we get grace, we get forgiveness. And then if you go to the second movie, when she's taken on this evil guy, Max Lord, and that's a great name for him because he's maximizing his lordship over other people. I can't tell you the whole plot of the story, but basically he is the, the villain who is trying to get everything for himself and it's causing all sorts of conflict in the world. And Wonder Woman, her superpower isn't really a lot of physical uh, uh, tricks and, and electricity and, and brute force. In this movie, you know what her actual superpower is? Two things, truth and love. She actually doesn't take this evil villain down using her physical power. She takes this evil guy down with truth and love. She convinces him that what he's doing is wrong and he gives up and repents and therefore saves the world. Now you can use like just this Wonder Woman plot to point out there are biblical concepts in here, even they, even though the, 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 the movie was not written by a Christian. Wow, yeah. Obviously Christ, truth and love, right? The Bible says in John 14, 1, 14, uh, you know, the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth, right? And we can yes, throw right. love in there as mm -hmm. well. So that, that, that's awesome. All right. So now let's talk about Batman versus Superman. All right. Because, uh, I know people have issues with this particular movie because it's like, Hey, here's two of my favorite superheroes pitted against one another and whatnot. So you say Batman versus Superman addresses one of the biggest objections people have about God. Now, what is that objection and how can we use it? to evangelize people or teach our kids. Yeah, excellent. This movie, I know a lot of people didn't like it because why is Batman fighting Superman, right? Well, here's why Batman's fighting Superman. Because there's an evil villain in this movie called Lex Luthor. And Lex Luthor believes that Superman is the god of the world he's in. And he's mad at Superman. Why is he mad at Superman? Because Superman, as God of the world, didn't protect Lex Luthor from Lex Luthor's abusive father. He didn't stop his father from doing evil to Lex Luthor. So he says, this guy's a bad God, and he convinces Batman that Superman has gone rogue, so Batman goes after Superman to try and kill him. And right in the movie, Lex Luthor actually is quoting Epicurus, who's a Greek philosopher who says, if there is a good God, why is there evil? And so this is one of the greatest objections of all time, right? If there is a good God, why is there evil? Now, one of the things that you notice in this movie is that Lex Luthor is mad at God, Superman, because Superman didn't stop Lex Luthor's father from doing evil to him. But notice what Lex Luthor is not mad about. He's not mad that Superman or God hasn't stopped him from doing evil to other people. Notice that? <laughs> he just wants God to stop other people from doing evil to him. He doesn't want God to stop him from doing evil to other people. Mm -hmm. And I find this is very true about us, isn't it? How often do we say, hey, God, why don't you stop all the evil in the world? Why don't you stop him? Or God, why don't you stop her? You know what we never say? God, why don't you stop me? Here's my question to everybody watching. Ladies and gentlemen, if God were to stop evil tonight at midnight, would you still be alive at 1201? <laughs> right? I know I wouldn't be alive at 1201. Why does God allow evil? Because he allows free will. Why does he allow free will? So we can love. If we don't have free will, we can't love. The problem is free will gives us the opportunity to do evil. And by the way, evil does not disprove God. It actually shows God does exist because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good. And there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. And so Evil doesn't disprove God. Evil may prove there's a devil out there, but it doesn't disprove God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. So the whole thing collapses, but what a wonderful opportunity. If you're a parent, say, to have a conversation with your kid who just watched Batman versus Superman to talk about why is there evil if there is a good God, right? What kind of solutions did the movie come up with? 
what do you what do you think your answer is to that right or someone you're sitting next to on a plane or your friend or something you know did you see this movie what do, what do you think about that and why do you think batman is always fighting evil but he never wins in other words he never can take a vacation what's he trying to do he's trying to stop evil he's trying to he's trying to lock up all the bad guys in gotham do you realize that batman can't win because batman has the most realistic a uh, view of human nature in virtually any superhero movie because batman is pointing out that evil is everywhere e even if i lock up as many super or as many villains as i can i'm never going to create utopia here on earth because there's always going to be somebody else who's going to do evil as well mm -hmm. so these are wonderful opportunities in order to you know to use these stories like paul used the stories of his day to witness to people wow Wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. Great, great, great answer. All right. Now, now we're getting into some of my personal favorites. Oh, yeah, Star baby. Wars. Oh, yeah. All, I, I'm a Star Wars person. And so... Uh, so Let me ask you this question then. You're better okay. at the Star Wars stuff than me. All right. Is that all right? All right. All right. All right. All right. So what is Anakin Skywalker's fall to the dark? I, this spoiler alert, ladies and gentlemen, spoiler <laughs> alert. If you don't know that Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader, where have you been for the past 44 years? Anyway, <laughs> right. Right. what does Anakin Skywalker's fall to the dark side teach us about the nature of sin? Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, once again, for those of you who, who may not be familiar, uh, with the general storyline, uh, Anakin Skywalker is the central figure of the first three movies, which uh, were actually came out after the original three. All right. And so he was supposed to be the chosen one. He was supposed to be the next Jedi. Right. He had he was supposed to, to carry the torch, if you will. And and all signs pointed to him being the next hope, if you will. Right. But. Because of his fears, because of his insecurities, because of his anger and his greed and his lust for power and control, Here right? You go. He succumbed to the dark side, right? Uh, as you know, there's a light, there's dark side, and all of this in the in the movies. But what it really teaches us is that within all of us, there is this inherent propensity or tendency towards the dark side, but we have a choice because later on, you'll see that he had a son whose name was Luke Skywalker. And Luke had the same choice that presented to him later on in his life. Are you going to choose to be on the light, in the light, right? Or are you going to choose to go the way of your dad, the dark side? Now, there's a lot of lessons here. One of the lessons is that just because our parents may have made certain choices does not mean that you and I are destined to make the same ones, right? Darth Vader, his father, Anakin Skywalker, chose the dark side, right? But that does not mean that Luke Skywalker also has to choose that. He still has a choice to make, no matter what his father did. So if your father is a, someone who's cheats, your father is an alcoholic, your father may have gotten several divorces, listen, you can't use that as an excuse to succumb to the dark side, even though that temptation and that desire may be well within you, mm -hmm. you always have the choice. But the big lesson is that inerrant in all of us, and even, even later, spoiler alert, you'll see that there were some times when even Luke Skywalker was very, very tempted mm -hmm. to go the way of his father, but something kept him from, from, from going the way of the dark side. But in all of us, there is this inherent nature of sin. You know, it's interesting, too. If you, if you look at the series, Alan, and we'll tell you about, uh, I, we just wrote a book on this. We'll tell you about the book a little bit later. But the, the interesting thing about this, we point this out in the book, is that George Lucas, who wasn't a Christian, and he brought, brought up a Christian, but uh, the, the, the basic worldview of Star Wars is more pantheistic. However, there were Christian elements in it. And one of them is the fact that if you look at people on the dark side, physically they're degraded. Like for example, Darth Vader, you know, is all burnt up and he's on a breathing machine most of the time and he's got all this stuff all over him. The, the emperor, right, is all shriveled up, right? But then you look at the people on the light side and they're pure, like Luke Skywalker, you know, doesn't have anything wrong with him, okay? And this is, this is uh, Lucas's way of saying that there are consequences to being 
in sin. There are consequences to being on the dark side, physical consequences. And there are benefits to not being in sin. You're not going to have as many of these uh, physical consequences. So I just thought visually that was qu- that's quite interesting. You look at the people on the dark side, they're in a bad way. The people on the light side are, are pretty pure. Yeah. And I love that, guys, you know, because we're not going to get into theological conversations about can you lose your salvation and all that. I don't necessarily believe that you do. But what I will say is this, is that you can be saved and God still gives you the choice to live like a non-believer. What I mean by that is to make decisions and to get into behavior, right, that is consistent with or similar to the behavior of non-believers. And so once again, this doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, but it does mean that you are going to have to incur and deal with the consequences of your sin in the same way that Darth Vader and all those who went to the dark side had to deal with those consequences. All right. So we got another one that I think is really good. And I think I got an answer for this one here too. So go on. Yeah, you take one that too. one. That's a good one right there. So what does Luke Skywalker's relationship with his father, Darth Vader, uh, or Anakin Skywalker teach us about evangelism and redemption? This is big, Alan. Take this one. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is huge. I think both Frank and I are going to have to tackle this one. So once again, Spoiler alert, all right, if you haven't watched it, I am so sorry, but this point is worth spoiling it for you, all right? So, at some point, Luke Skywalker learns that Darth Vader is his father, and Darth Vader used to be Anakin Skywalker, but then when he went to the dark side, he became Darth Vader, right? And so he becomes aware of this. But there's something very, very interesting about the relationship between Luke his father, or excuse me, Luke, and his father, Darth Vader. As evil as Darth Vader was, as much as Darth Vader was trying to actually hurt and kill his own son, Luke Skywalker, in a lightsaber battle and all this stuff, Luke Skywalker never saw his father as being too far gone to return to the light. He was so far in the dark side but he said to himself, you know, there's still some good in you, Father. I know there is. He even quoted, I said, I, I, I know there's something in you, Father. You can turn. You can turn. And so oftentimes, guys, we give up on people that we think are too far gone. That's we see right. that person at our job. We see that person in our neighborhood. We see that person uh, who we work with or whatever. And we think to ourselves, this person is so far gone on the dark side, there is no way that they can actually be saved. But later on, spoiler alert, what you will see is (laughs) that at the very end of Darth Vader's life, at the last second, and I'm sorry to spoil it for you, but it's worth it, all right? Luke Skywalker was, was getting ready to be taken out and by the emperor. And Darth Vader actually saved his son and risked his life to throw the emperor down this pit to save his own son, Luke's life, and then ultimately he died, right? But the point is that there was this seemingly redemption or last minute uh, change, if you will, that showed that even someone as dark as Darth Vader is still able to be redeemed. Frank, what are your thoughts, man? Yeah, and we should not give up on anyone, right? No matter how far gone they are. You know, in the book, we have a section in there, can, can bad people go to heaven? And we talk about Darth Vader. You know, this Vader killed entire villages and did some very evil things. How could he go to heaven? And you know what the conclusion to the section is, Alan? Only bad people go to heaven because there are no good people, right? We all need to be saved. We may be a little bit better than our neighbors in certain things. Yeah, okay, I'm not a serial killer. Okay, I get that. But you're still fallen. You're comparing yourself to other bad people. That's not the st- that, that's not the standard. You need to compare yourself to the perfect God. And in that way, none of us make it. This is why when the rich young ruler called Jesus good, he said, why do you call me good? There's nobody good but God. So if somebody claims they're good, you know what you ought to ask them? You're either God or you're lying. Because there's only one who's good, and that's God. So only bad people go to heaven. Think about that. It's exactly the opposite of what the culture thinks. It's only bad people that go to heaven, and they go to heaven because of what Jesus did. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Now, one more Star Wars one, and I'm going to let right. you talk tackle this one. All what right. can we learn from Han Solo's journey to faith? Walk us through that. 
Well, first of all, I love Han Solo because he is the skeptic in the series, and he's got all the best lines, like, look, your worshipfulness, I take orders from just one person, me, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and he says, I'm not in it, for, I'm, I'm not in it for your little cause, I'm in it for the money, I expect to be paid handsomely, princess, you know, <laughs> anyway, so he's, and he's, he's real cocky too, so he'll say stuff like, hey, kid, don't get cocky, and yet he's the cockiest one of all, right? Anyway, what happens to Han? And by the way, Han Solo is the perfect name for this guy. Why? Because it's all about him. He's Solo, right? He doesn't want to be part of the team. He's in it for himself. Anyway, what happens to him, as you know, he gets in debt to, to Jabba the Hutt, who's way bigger than a hut, by the way. Jabba captures him, puts him, freezes him in debt in carbonite. You know, you owe me. You're not getting out of this until somebody pays your debt. Well, who comes to pay his debt? Luke Skywalker. Luke comes and rescues him and actually kills Jabba, takes the guy to whom he owes the debt to away. So now Han is free. He's been redeemed by Luke Skywalker. And as the series goes on, Luke, I mean, uh, Han goes from a guy who said, hey, this force is just nonsense. You gotta have a good blaster at your side, kid. That's what re you really need. Two, as the series goes on, he, he eventually says, hey, this is all true. I didn't think it was, but it's all true. Now, why did he convert? He converted for two reasons. Number one, somebody redeemed him. And number two, he saw the evidence. Hmm. And he followed the evidence where it led. He noticed that the force was true in this universe, that it really did work. And so the same should be true with us, right? We're in debt. We need to be redeemed. And we ought to look at the evidence because it's really true. It's just not a wish out there. In fact, you know when the Bible uses the word hope in the New Testament? I know you know this, Alan, because you're actually a Greek scholar. It doesn't mean like, oh, I just wish it'll come true. It means it's certain. It's a hope in the future. It's already, but not yet, right? It's already happened, but we don't have all the fruits of it now. And that's really the, the, the deal here. We know it's true. We have evidence for it, just like Han Solo uh, converted. We ought to convert by looking at the evidence. And, you know, there's one other point that I want to bring out here that um, that you that you actually brought out in your book. And that mm -hmm. is the fact that, um, you know, Han Solo, we're going to we're going to we're going to coin him and call him the skeptic. OK, because he was very skeptical of this whole force thing. Right. Like the force. Right. What is that? The force doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing. Right. And so think about so think about that as somebody who is a non-believer. And and now look, I'm not trying to say the Holy Spirit is the force. So don't 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 go there. Okay. So but what I'm saying is oftentimes the the, the non-believers are skeptical of anything supernatural or, and skeptical of any power of the Holy Spirit, right? But what's interesting about Han Solo's story is that it wasn't enough for him to uh uh it, it, like being skeptical about it, having questioned about it, wasn't going to enable him to actually experience the force for himself. He had to first believe that's right, that's that right. the force yeah. was what it was. And then once he placed his faith that the force was everything that they said it was, he then was able to experience it, right? And so for the skeptics, we would say to them, listen, it, it, you, you're not going to understand or to be able to appreciate or experience the power of the Holy Spirit as long as you stay a skeptic. You first right, have right. to believe, and then when you believe, you'll be able to experience it. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Yeah. What else we got, man? We got some more questions? And we're going to take yeah, some from the chat too, maybe, absolutely. right? <laughs> All oh, right, yeah. so now let's get into Tony Stark. You write that something happens to Tony Stark that provides a biblical lesson we all need to learn, especially our kids. What is the lesson from Tony Stark? Yeah, okay, all the details are in our book, Hollywood Heroes. We'll get to more of that later. But this, uh, Tony Stark is my favorite character, okay? Uh, of all these superhero books and, or superhero movies, we go through Captain America, Iron Man, Lord of the Rings, Batman, Harry Potter, uh, Wonder Woman. Um, I'm probably leaving one out, but there's about seven different franchises we go through. And for me, Tony Stark is my favorite character. Here's why. He starts out as an amoral arms dealer who's a billionaire playboy, right? And he has what most men would want. He's got all the money he wants. He's got all the power he wants. And he has a great girlfriend. But he's still not happy. He's miserable. 
Now, most people think, look, if I have those three big things, if I have a girlfriend and I have money and I have power, I'm happy. That's not the case. You ought to ask your, your kids, why is Tony Stark not happy? You know what Robert Downey Jr. said about this? He said, the reason that he's not happy is because Tony Stark is spiritually empty. And the way I would put it he, is he has everything to live with and nothing to live for. Then an event occurs in his life where one of his own weapons blows up, puts shrapnel in his chest, and he has to have a device put in the middle of his chest to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. Now, this is a wonderful picture of what I think is the most important Bible verse today for young people, other than the gospel itself. It comes from Proverbs 4.23. It says this, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Above all else, the culture says, follow your heart. The biblical wisdom is to guard your heart. Why? Because if you follow your heart without moral restraint, you're going to wind up like Tony Stark, alone, uh, lost, and full of anxiety. But Tony guards his heart and ultimately transitions, uh, is transformed into a hero called Iron Man who actually sacrifices himself, Alan, to save the world. So he goes from a selfish playboy to a guy who's gonna sacrifice himself to save the world from Thanos, who was the evil Satan figure in the whole series. So here's, here's a movie that has nothing to do with Christianity, but it's got one of the best biblical lessons that I think any young person and even old people should get. You need to guard your heart, not follow your heart. Mm -hmm. I love what you said, that uh, we can have everything. What did you say? We can have everything, but to, to to live yeah, with, to, but nothing to live for or something Yeah, like Tony that. has everything to live with and nothing to live for. Wow. And, and by the way, think about what, why is there so many suicides now, Alan? Mm. We live in the most comfortable time in human history in this country, and yet our suicide rate is through the roof. Why? People have everything to live with and nothing to live for. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so we've already covered a lot of these, but you can uh, maybe maybe throw a couple more in there. But as you look at these and we kind of wrap this thing up a little bit, what are some of the most common themes that you see in some of the superhero movies just on a broad level that remind us of the gospel message? The biggest is sacrifice. That people sacrifice themselves to rescue other people and take them to safety. And most people in our world today wish that were true. This is why these, particularly these superhero movies resonate with people, because we all personally want to be taken out of this world of pain and suffering, be rescued from it and taken to the promised land where we will live a life of bliss. Well, that's actually the promises of Christianity, Alan. Hmm. That's why these movies resonate. I mean, let's, let's go back to Endgame for a second, where Tony Stark takes out Thanos at the end and he sacrifices himself to do it. Imagine if, if, if Tony Stark had said this instead, if he turned to his Avengers buddies and said, hey guys, you know, I'm not gonna fight Thanos, man. I gotta start, I gotta get back to following my heart and just taking care of me. You guys handle it, I'm out. Would, would that enchant us at all? Would we go, what a great movie? No, we'd go, that stunk, man. That guy just ran out on his friends. He didn't do anything to stop evil. That wouldn't resonate with anybody. But what resonates? When people see peep, other people sacrificing themselves to save others. That's what Jesus did for us. Mm. Yeah, awesome. So sacrifice is a key theme. Uh, key, redemption, once key. again, guys, yes. is, an, is another key theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everywhere. Redemption, uh, going from a place of brokenness to a, a, a place of restoration is a theme that goes through all of these movies. And that's something that uh, I think is, it needs to be pointed out. In fact, let me let me find this quote. The newest Batman came out, which I haven't seen the, 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 uh, the entire movie yet. I did see a clip. My son, who co-wrote the book Hollywood Heroes with me, uh, saw the movie and said it ended this way. This was the last thing I think said in the movie, if I can find it here. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but basically what happened at the end of the movie was Batman said, vengeance is not enough. People need to know there's someone out there. They have to have hope. Well, guess what? There is someone out there. There is hope. Hmm. Jesus came once as our sacrifice, and he's going to come again as the returning king, which as you know, uh, the 
the name of the third Lord of the Rings movie was The Return of the King. Why? Because it's, it's a Christian story. When the king comes back, he's going to make everything right. So people need hope. You can only have two things in life. You can either have hope or you can have despair. And what these movies give people is the hope that they really want. And that's what Jesus does. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we, we're not going to forget about the ladies. All right. Because we've been talking yep. a whole lot about the guys, Luke Skywalker, Anakin, Tony Stark, Batman, right? So let's give the ladies some love here. Okay. What does, how does Wonder Woman show us the truth? Uh, how, how, does, how does Wonder Woman show us that the truth is more important than what we want? Yeah, because in the Wonder Woman 1984, Wonder Woman has her love interest come back in her life. But in order for her to save the world, she has to deny her love. She has to deny following her heart in order to, to take out Max Lord in this plot. And so instead of her saying, I got to follow my heart, I'm in love with Steve. She says, I know I have to give Steve up because the truth is that Steve needs, I need to give up my wish and Max Lord needs to give up his wish in order for the world to be put back right. In other words, we got to follow the tru truth rather than follow our hearts. Mm -hmm. Again, this is another move. This is another illustration of both Iron Man here a minute ago and now Wonder Woman saying, don't follow your heart, follow the truth. Which is, which is a great message for this young, uh, really for any age people, because, you know, that, that, that idea permeates our culture today is that people totally. just say, uh, my heart is leading me, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about being married anymore and being happily married or, or uh, being committed. No, my heart is out of the marriage. Therefore, I'm going to get a divorce. I've elevated my level of happiness above truth. What's the truth? Mm -hmm. The truth is I've committed till death do us part, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, right? For richer or for poor. That's the truth. The truth is that I made that commitment to my wife. But you know what is going to be more important than that? My heart, um, my, the way I feel, my happiness. If I'm not happy, therefore, I should follow my heart, follow my happiness, instead of following, wait a second, the Bible says the truth in this marriage is that I am to be committed to this person till death do us part. And so I think that once again, guys, we're just trying to say that as you are watching these movies with your friends, your coworkers, or most importantly, your children, That's right. it's okay to press pause in the middle of the movie and say, you know what, let's talk about that. Do you think that Wonder Woman should have just uh, followed her love interest? What do you think would have happened with that? Or why do you think that she did this? And how do you think that that plays out in the real life? How do you think that's going to work in your own life? And just use these conversations that, you know, you might be able to have with your children to spark some other conversations. All right. That's just a right. fun way. We're not saying this it's, is the only way, but it's no. just a fun way. No. Yeah. It's, if, if, if you can have movie night with kids, uh, you're not going to get the eye roll. <laughs> you know, they're going to be like, oh, cool, mom, dad. But sometimes when you get preachy, right? They're like, they don't want to hear it. But if, if the character that they love in the movie is telling them the same thing, you can go, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. So speaking of that, guys, we're going to kind of wrap this up. And then Frank's going to tell us a bit about um, what he's got uh, uh, just recently just got released today, which is exciting. Uh, but we're going to look at just some practical ways, right? So this is the fourth P, practical. So what are some practical ways, Frank? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question and we'll, we'll be done. What are mm -hmm. some practical ways we can use movies to create common ground conversations with the lost and help make the gospel message more understandable to our youth? Give well, that's what we cover. Practical ways to do that. Yeah, that's what we cover in here. This is the new book, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. It just came out today. And as I say, we go through Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, uh, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Wonder Woman, and Batman. There's a little bit of Superman in there as well, a little bit of Spider-Man. And then the last chapter is the ultimate hero. Who's the ultimate hero? Jesus of Nazareth. All these characters point to the ultimate hero, Jesus of Nazareth. So one way that you can do this is we have these questions at the back of each chapter that we say you can ask of people who've seen the movies, or you can ask of your kids if you just watch the movies, right? And, and, bring these points home. So I think just asking questions and being deliberate 
I mean, what kid, what teenager is going to say, oh, dad, I don't want to watch Iron Man tonight, or I don't want to watch Endgame, or I don't want to watch Batman, or I don't want, you know, (laughs) they're going to be like, this is great. Let's do this once a week. And we can teach biblical life lessons, good theology, and even much, many uh, aspects of apologetics, because we've weaved all that through this book, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. So we thought, Personally, as parents, this is a this is a great thing you can do with your kids. And then when you're dealing with your neighbors or your other friends, you go see a movie. People love talking about movies. You can go to movies with them and then you can talk about things like, hey, what did you think of, of what that guy did there? Uh, did you think that was right? Why did you think it wasn't right? What, what's your standard by saying that was right and this is wrong? I mean, you can get into these spiritual conversations really quickly. So those are some of the practical things I think you can. And I know you got some ideas, too. What do you what do you think? Yeah, no, I think I think those are all good, guys. I just think that um, once again, you know, keeping in mind that uh, you know that um, whether or not these movies may be, may be the top things that are on your list of things to do today or whatever, just know that you know there's an element where once again the principle go back to the principle, right? Paul said, "I've got to become all things to all people, so that by any means I may save some." That's right, right. and so. You know, it wouldn't hurt you to, you know, to watch some of these movies, to to, to be aware of them um, so that when they come up at work, you can engage and you can have these conversations. Or once again, God forbid, like I said, your children, I'm sure, are watching these. And instead of being a parent to just saying, well, that's just not for me. You know what? That's their thing. No, engage with them. They're going to actually enjoy that. And you can have those conversations with them. So, And, th- and um, that's what Paul yeah. did. That's what he did. He engaged with people based on their own poets, their own stories. He used them. And Jesus made up stories in order to, in order to make a point, right? Uh, that's yeah. what the parables were. They weren't real events in life. They were made up stories to put forth a moral or theological point. And that's what we can do with the stories of our culture. In fact, you know what George Barna said, the, the famous pollster? He said that Americans get more theology from the cinema than they do from the pulpit. Oh, wow. Mm. So let's, let's use the cinema when we can for good, because those images and those stories can be ingrained in people's minds uh, if they're done well and if you point them out. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, okay, so guys, we're going to take just maybe uh, five or 10 minutes of your questions that you may have. Um, if you have any, uh, I'm going to put them on the uh, screen right here. All right. And if there's any questions that you guys have, uh, we'll take some time and, uh, and we'll wrap up here in a little bit. So do you guys have any questions for Frank or for myself um, that we can ask uh, and answer for you guys? Uh, I don't know if Jorge has any that uh, submitted on his end. I think I saw him post something earlier. I'm not sure or not. But, um, uh, well, here's a good comment. Uh, Kat says, I'm going to buy that book. I want to read about Harry Potter. Okay. So uh, that is awesome. Uh, I think Let me say something will- about that. Uh, because yeah. I, I just did an interview with our mutual friend, Greg Kokel of Stand to Reason. And the only chapter he read in the book was Harry Potter because he loves the Harry Potter books. And now he's made it his mission now to read all the Harry Potter books after he read the chapter on Harry Potter and Hollywood heroes. So, <laughs> so he, 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 he gave it a big endorsement. So check it out. It's called Hollywood heroes. How your favorite movies reveal God. It just came out. Yeah, today. guys, I got my copy right here and I'm looking forward to going through it, but I also don't want to go through it until I watch like all the movies, because I don't want to, I already feel like I a spoiler alert for some of them. So I'm going <laughs> to, I've seen most of them, but not, maybe not all of them. So um, that's awesome. Thank you, Kat. Uh, let's see the other questions that you guys have. Let's just see here. Uh, somebody said Iron Man and last Monday's Bible study is now explained. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, all right. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, uh, let's just see here. Uh, okay, this looks like a question. I'm not sure exactly what it says, but Kevin says, I am a filmmaker. How can we as filmmakers ensure that we are making movies that help bring people to Christ without necessarily making it a Christian movie? That's a great question. Yeah, I think you can highlight elements of Christianity without d- connecting all the dots for people, right? Redemption, you already brought that up, Alan. Sacrifice. Those are things 
that can, can that you don't have to connect the dots for, but when they see it in Christianity, after they're enchanted by it in a movie, they can go, wow, this is what I've been looking for, actually. I've been looking for redemption. I've been looking for somebody who's going to come save me. That's what this actual, that's what Christianity actually is, right? It's not about, it's, Christianity is not about making bad people good. Christianity is about making dead people live. That's what it's about. We're all dead without God. So God comes and takes it from us. You know, uh, this is a great question too, Kevin, because who was I talking to recently about this? I can't remember who I was talking to about it, but um, they were watching a series that um, they the that they really loved for the first two seasons. And in the third season, they tried to insert actually the something biblical Christianity would disagree with. They tried to make the focus of this particular series uh, a person's sexual orientation. They they tried to talk about LGBTQ issues as 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 if that took center stage in this series, and the people said it just got so preachy. It got so tiresome. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. Mm -hmm. It was a good series that they, you know, the, these things were in the background. They weren't front and center, but now you're making this, this, this preachy thing front and center and it's off putting. That's one of the problems Christians have. They try and make art to be actually a lecture. And that's not what art is traditionally for. Art is not supposed to be a lecture. It's, mm -hmm. it's supposed to, it's supposed to enchant it's supposed to get you thinking, but it's not supposed to connect all the dots for you in most cases. Yeah. Unless you're doing, say, the passion or something, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Get you thinking. Mm -hmm. All right, there's another one. Uh, let's just see here. Uh, Keegan says, how far is too far when writing an evil character as long as they are defeated in the end? Thanks for the great work. Okay. What do you think about that, Alan? I, I think we need more context to know how far evil is, right? Yeah, I, I, I struggle a little bit with this one. I'm not sure necessarily, um, you know, uh, how to answer that. If I'm just being honest, I'm not sure. There are some there are some really seriously evil characters in the Bible, as you know. These people, of course, were real people, so they're being we're being told what they actually did. Uh, so. I mean, uh, yeah. the further someone falls, the greater their redemption is. Yeah. So I, I guess it really depends on the context of what you're talking about. What's the next one? Okay, so this one is an interesting one. Uh, it says, nice that you put on those movies Christian perspective, but I feel like, unfortunately, many of these movies are actually very blasphemous. Okay, so once again, speak, speak to that. We talked about that at the very beginning, how this isn't an endorsement of Mm -hmm. of all of the things that happen in the movies. And Frank brought out a good point earlier about, you know, you could say that 70% of the things that happen in the Bible are blasphemous, but we read them, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, because yeah. we're supposed to learn lessons from them. So what are your, what are mm -hmm. your thoughts on this particular question? Well, well actually, if, if we had a, the chance to dialogue, uh, I would ask, what do you mean by blasphemous? What does that even mean? Mm. Uh, are you saying that they're, they present a Christian or an anti-Christian worldview, if that's what you mean. I might agree that a lot of them do have anti-Christian elements in them. But here's my point, is that even the anti-Christian writers can't help copying from God because if they don't have elements of sacrifice, redemption, and love in these films, they're unwatchable. They're, they're not going to enchant you. What's going to enchant you are the things that are really true and what is really true sacrifice love grace redemption so even those you you you, you, you if you're an atheist you can't make a movie about nihilism that people are going to love right they're not they're not going to love it they're not they're not going to love when nobody is loved nobody's redeemed evil is not overcome they're not going to love that kind of movie they're only going to love a kind of movie that ultimately overcomes evil and shows a a attributes of uh yeah or the the virtues of sacrifice and grace and redemption and all these things yeah now here's a great question for you frank because your kids are a little older than mine well your kids are a lot older than mine your kids are out of the house <laughs> and my kids are four and five so yeah How, yeah and, you, and, you've lived in, in fact my oldest son wrote this book with me he's 34. <laughs> so wow. Zach Turek has written this book with me. Yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Frank and his mm -hmm. and his and his and his son uh, co-wrote this book. So what a, what a blessing to be able to do that. 
Question, how do we know when our kids are ready to watch these movies? Now, that's a great question. That yeah, is, and again, it depends on what the movie is. I would say most girls are ready by the time they're seven. Most guys are ready by the time they're 37. <laughs> <laughs> boys boys never grow up do we i mean no it, it it really depends and here's one thing my wife was always great at um and she still is even you know the boys are in their 30s now she would talk about any issue with them very directly without getting freaked out about anything i know a lot of parents get freaked out when they're you know you have to talk about sex or you have to talk about uh something that might be uncomfortable if you freak out with your kids over those issues, do you think your kid's ever going to come back to you and ask you about those issues again? No. Man, I brought this up to mom and she freaked out. I'm not going to go to her. I'm going to go to TikTok. I'm going to go to the internet. I'm going to go to my friends. No, we need to talk to our kids at a very young age about these issues when we think they're age appropriate and talk about them in a way that uh, isn't all um, tense and and um it's a word i'm looking for here um you, you 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 don't get all nervous talking about it you talk about these issues in a matter of fact way so kids can learn yeah yeah that's awesome all right here's another one um i'm trying to bring up some that people have these objections so mm -hmm. what about the fact that a lot of these writers who created these characters are openly practicing the occult or purposely put anti-God themes in their work. You mean just like God put all that stuff in the Bible? Hmm. Look, when you're a mature adult and you understand truth from fiction, you can watch, you can read the Bible, you can watch these things and, and point out what's good and then point out what's bad. You learn a lot by looking at, at things that happen that are evil. That's what Paul says, right? That's what we already said this earlier. He says this in 1 Corinthians and Romans. These evil things that occurred in the Old Testament are examples to you, to instruct you. In fact, it, he even goes on, the famous verse that many of us have memorized, he, he talks about that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. What is common to man? All the temptations that you see the people in the Old Testament fell to. But God is faithful. He will always provide a way out so you, will, you can stand up under it. That's the context of that verse that these people in the old testament have done these evil things that they've succumbed to temptation but i'm putting them in my revelation so you won't succumb so you can stand up and so when you see these things in movies or in books you can say yeah i can see that's evil i'm not going to succumb to it but if you try and shelter yourself completely from every story you're never going to read a book you're never going to watch a movie no movie would be interesting if it was and they lived happily ever after right from the beginning right there's always going to be a conflict between good and evil otherwise the movie's not going to go anywhere yeah and, and i'm going to add one other thing guys this is this is the idea of the origin fallacy which is which is you know that uh because something was uh, created by someone who maybe practices this, that, and the other. Therefore, we should totally ban and boycott everything mm -hmm. else that they did. Now, I'm just going to say this. If you live by that, then live by that. Okay? That means that there's most of the things that probably you engage with now, you're probably going to have to give up. You're probably going to have to give up Netflix. You're probably going to have to give up Spotify. You're probably going to have to give up cable. You're probably going to have to give up certain places where you go to eat. Because who knows? Whoa. Whoa. Somebody who owns this restaurant very well might be practicing the call. I don't want to support them, right? Or wow, I don't want to support Netflix, you know, uh, because maybe the person who owns that or the maybe or maybe the person who wrote this does this. Like at some point, guys, you, you, like Frank said, you have to be mature and say, you know what? Just because I am viewing this or taking this in, that once again, very well might be a positive thing, Right. Just because the person who created it might have a certain lifestyle, which, by the way, somebody could say the same thing about Christians, Christians who write worship songs, right? Christians mm -hmm. who write worship songs, but then cheat on their wife. Mm. Are you not going to listen to that worship song anymore yeah, because it was yeah. written by somebody who, God forbid, is a heathen, an evil sinner, right? Or somebody, oh, we don't want to talk about this. Somebody maybe, uh, oh, your pastor who... 50% of the pastors out there admit to watching inappropriate activity. I'm not going to say the word because I might get banned, but inappropriate adult <laughs> entertainment, right? All right. Uh -huh. uh, uh, 50% of them. 
So are you not going to go to church and not going to listen to your pastor? Because the statistics show these are just the people who admit to it. So it's probably a lot higher than that, right? So once again, don't necessarily make your decision based on the origin or the person. Make your decision on the content, right? And that 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 would be what I would say to that. I will right, we'll take maybe one more, one or two more uh, good ones here. Uh, somebody did ask about why you did not include uh, the Chronicles of Narnia in your book. Um, yeah, this person says, Cedric says, why did you not include Car Chronicles of Narnia in your book? You probably just didn't have room for everything. Yeah, we couldn't get to everything. We have we had other other franchises we had to leave out as well. So my son is the whiz on all of these movies. He's seen and knows every single one of them. He's read all the books. So we just picked the ones we were most familiar with. Not that we haven't seen Narnia, but we just thought that uh, we would rather most Christians know about Narnia, but they don't know how to use, say, Iron Man for evangelism, or they don't know how to use Captain America or or uh, Wonder Woman or Batman or Harry Potter, right? So we wanted to take those films and say, look, these films have, have very redeeming qualities. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> I could put this one on the screen, but I'm not going to. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you just want to say it, Alan? What? <laughs> oh, man. You know what? You know, I might as well. Okay. Go ahead. So Jay Toll says, question, Alan, are you ready for all the negative response videos? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, listen, you know what? Um, I'll just say this. In no way, shape, or form am I comparing myself to Jesus at all. I, 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 I mean, nowhere near, right? But if... Jesus was persecuted. How can we expect to experience something different? Jesus mm -hmm. even promised and said, you are no mm -hmm. greater than your ma a slave is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Now, Jesus was perfect. He did nothing to deserve it. And yet they still persecuted him. So look, guys, you cannot, I cannot please everyone. And nor am I going to try because that's very, very tiring. All right. If I say that you can lose your salvation, people are going to make response videos about that. If I say you can't lose your salvation, people are going to make responsibilities about that. If I say I'm a Calvinist, which I'm not, right? Uh, people are going to make responsibilities about that. If I say I'm an Armenian, they're going to make responsibilities about that. If I say tongues is, uh, is has ceased and there's, tongues does not exist anymore, people are going to make responsibilities about that. If I say every Christian has to speak in tongues, people are going to criticize me for that, which I don't believe, right? You cannot ex escape criticism. All I can do and all Frank and I can do is teach the Bible, stand for the truth as best we can. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, there's nothing that we share today that's unbiblical. We're just two men having a conversation about how we can potentially use modern media and movies to evangelize or to strike up basic conversation. Don't take it for any more than that. That's it. Just keep it real mm -hmm. simple, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Don't, don't try to make it more than that. That's all this conversation is all about. All right. But there's nothing unbiblical at all about anything that we have talked about today. And so if people want to make response videos towards me or Frank, that's fine. You know what? They have the right to do that. That's YouTube. And uh, it's called YouTube for a reason. It's about you. You have the opportunity to have freedom of speech. <laughs> right. I, all I can say is that I am going to always maintain my Christ like character. And there's people out there making, you know, response videos all the time. I'm not going to spend my time trying to respond to their response videos. I would rather spend my time studying the word of God and preparing for this upcoming four part series that I have for you all at the end of May. Spoiler alert. It's going to be Monday through Thursday. I'm going to be going live four nights. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you do not want to miss it. I'm going to be going live every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for a really, really exciting four part series. And it's one that I'm going to be working really hard on. It's one I've worked on for a while. And, uh, and so uh, that, that's what I would rather spend my time doing than to be, you know, chasing down uh, every response video. I, I, there's a point where as a minister, you must rise above all of those things. Amen to that, brother. You get a round of applause, man, because you, you said that perfectly. I just want to, I just want to add one thing to that. Please Look, do. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, you want to make response videos, make response videos against heretics. 
Make response videos against people that are denying the essentials of the faith. I can assure you that Alan Parr is not denying any essentials of the faith, okay? And neither am I. So save your, your time and effort and go after the people that need to be exposed. If you want to be a sheepdog, be a sheepdog, but don't go after a brother in Christ who, who may disagree with you on some tertiary issue that, that isn't the center of Christianity. Yeah. Amen, guys. And, and you know what? And I think that's a great place for us to end tonight. Listen, and, and I hope you all hear our heart. There, there's just too much division. It's got to stop, mm -hmm, guys. Mm -hmm. It's got to stop. Listen, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to even create a video where you, you express what you believe is the truth. But I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be straight up honest, guys. When, when, when YouTubers start making videos where you start calling out people like other YouTubers by name and your whole goal is to try to disprove that person, when deep in your heart, you know that that person is a brother of Christ, you know mm -hmm. that that person mm -hmm. ultimately is trying to, uh, to, 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 to move the gospel forward, right? And I'm not going to say I've never done that. I think on, out of 600 videos, I may have done that once or twice. But you know what? The Lord convicted me about that. And ever since then, you know what I do when I disagree with something? I create a video where I talk about the truth of what I believe. I do not mention these people's names, right? But I just say, you know what? This is what I believe about this. Because at the end of the day, I'm not trying actively to create division in the body of Christ, right? Right? And I think that there's just too much of that going on uh, in YouTube. And it's sad. It's sad because the outside world is looking at us as Christians and we're so divided and we're, you know, we're, uh, uh, we're not helping one another. So I think that's a great place for us to, to stop. Um, once again, guys, uh, where can they grab this book, Frank? Yeah, they can go to HollywoodHeroesBook.com, HollywoodHeroesBook.com, and that'll link them to any other bookseller. But there's a little video up there. There's more about what the book is about. So they go to HollywoodHeroesBook.com. They can they can get go to Amazon from there. They can go to Christian book distributors. They, they can go anywhere from that website. So check it out, HollywoodHeroesBook.com, and use this book with your kids. Man, if they're watching these movies anyway, why don't you – turn this into a theological and evangelistic opportunity with them. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll put a link in the description box below guys. So thank you all so much. Uh, guys, I'll just say this. I've got a really, really exciting video on Friday coming up and I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I need you guys. I need your help. I need you all to watch this video, share this video, uh, with people. Um, it's a very, very, very serious video. Um, and um, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll just save you the details, but uh, it's coming up on Friday. And so hopefully you guys will uh, will tune in. It's a long video. It's another interview that I did with a, a young lady I, I met recently, but I really think it's going to bless uh, you all and bless the body of Christ. So that'll be the next time you hear from me and uh, go subscribe to Cross Examined. Uh, YouTube channel, if you haven't done so already, phenomenal. Go download their app, phenomenal resources to help you defend your faith to an outside world and get you girded up in apologetics. Thank you and, all so and wait, much. Wait, gentlemen, those watching on our YouTube channel, you got to go to The Beat with Alan Parr and subscribe there, okay? The Beat with Alan Parr. So those watching on the Cross Examine YouTube channel, go subscribe to Alan. And Alan's putting out great stuff every week very biblically based. It goes into a lot more Bible than we do. We're dealing more with apologetics. Alan's dealing more with the theology and the Bible. So you need both. So make sure you sign up for Alan's website as well, or YouTube channel. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Frank. God bless right. everybody. And uh, we'll see you all another time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.